proving ground, visualizing to cut costs, sounding the data, listening for new insight, music by numbers, composing for complexity, vision for learning, publishing science with a difference. At the Proving Grounds, uh, you look at visibility, trying to see what kind of visibility you do have off the front side and off the back and off the sides. People have to see where that cutting edge is and they have to see what that bucket attitude is like to fill it. Dale Hendricks has been operating backhoe loaders for over 20 years. He tries out new backhoe designs for Caterpillar Incorporated at its Peoria test site known as the Proving Grounds. Whether it's digging trenches with the backhoe bucket or using the front end loader to shovel earth, the more that an operator can see of the tools, the quicker he can get the job done. Safety demands a sturdy cab to protect him, but its structure can limit visibility. Even at this stage, if the operator testing a new prototype sees too many blind spots, it's back to the drawing board. But now, Caterpillar engineers are trying to save time, cut costs, and improve development quality with a new method of visibility analysis. They are experimenting with animated visualizations. Collaborating with NCSA in its industrial partnership program, Caterpillar engineers and NCSA's visualization group have created an animated movie to assess operator visibility of a backhoe in an advanced computer graphics environment. As Caterpillar's on-site representative at NCSA, engineer Rich Ingram has been involved with the backhoe visualization project from the start. The way that this technology can really help with our design process is to prevent us from making any mistakes. Typically what we do now is we build a mock-up of the cab and then we put the operators, well, several operators in this cab, and they try to see if there's any visibility problems. When they identify that there is a problem, by that time, oftentimes, the design has already, you know, progressed along quite nicely, and then we have to back up and start over. In order to bypass some of the steps required in building mock-ups, Caterpillar design analyst David Cooper models new designs on the computer. He believed that animation of these models could provide additional analytical information and proposed the backhoe visualization project to Rich Ingram. We're doing visibility analysis on a single shot, point in time uh, reference, where we would move the tool of the bucket, tool or bucket or a portion of the vehicle into a specific location, and then do operator visibility analysis from that one spot. And we kind of realized that maybe we were maybe missing something, that maybe there's other points that the tool or bucket could be positioned at that we couldn't analyze the way we're doing it now. I've added the tires and you'll see that... Mark Bayouk, visualization programmer at NCSA, worked closely with David Cooper and Rich Ingram for several months developing the animation for the backhoe movie. The first test runs required obtaining Caterpillar's modeling data from two different pieces of software. These were in turn used to drive the wavefront rendering software used at NCSA. After all the data files were transferred, then came the real challenge. Because of the way that this particular problem was defined, um, we needed to find a closer mapping to how people actually see. We needed to try to push the definition of what the camera would be into something that would give us, a, for example, a, a horizontal angle of view of close to 180 degrees which is much a, a much closer match to peripheral vision in, in uh, humans. This little window right here is what a computer graphics camera would normally see when it's positioned at the viewpoint of the operator, which was defined by Caterpillar. Okay, this is the uh, format that we use for display whenever we're within the cabs looking from the operator's viewpoint. Now instead of one camera, we actually have seven relatively tall cameras, and this provides us with an angle of view of instead of 40 degrees, what we were roughly looking at before, now we're expanded out to about uh, plus or minus 70, yielding a total of about 140 degree angle of view. This hopefully maps much closer to the operator's peripheral vision and gives a better sense of being in the cab and looking out into the space. Although it had been talked about before, 
This was the first time anyone in NCSA's visualization group had used a multiple camera format. The Wavefront software is not designed to render multiple points of view, and defining the parameters for seven cameras in each frame of animation was therefore tricky. But now, as a result of the backhoe project, the group has broken into new territory in the use of the computer camera for graphic representation. I think all of us you know, that were involved with it learned quite a bit about some of the problems you know, that exist in this domain, but also with some of the possibilities. And already now, uh, somebody who's working on a project in our group is working with multiple cameras. Another scene in the movie depicts a light and shadow test. The visualization of light cones emanating from the cab helps demonstrate the operator's field of vision. You can create the solid model of the cab in question fairly rapidly on the computer and do the actual animation fairly quickly compared to creating a mock-up of that particular vehicle or cab and actually doing it the, the manual way. For David Cooper and Rich Ingram, the 18-scene backhoe animation movie is a success. The plans are to continue the collaboration with NCSA to learn different visualization techniques, test out software and hardware tools, and bring that knowledge back to Caterpillar. We have a number of different application areas where we can apply visualization techniques. Some of these include uh, computational fluid dynamics, uh, finite element analysis, as well as the viewing of new product designs. Computer graphics will never completely replace the building of mock-ups or the testing of new equipment. But the design cycle can be shortened with the aid of visualization animations, the new proving ground on the screen. As you look at these scientific visualizations, the changes of color and movement help you recognize patterns in the underlying data. But here, the science is being communicated to your ears as well as your eyes. Matching the visuals, the sounds are called data sonifications, and they're generated from the same data that drive the animations. The audio tracks were created by two University of Illinois researchers to demonstrate how sonification could help a scientist more easily interpret complex sets of data. Alan Craig is a visualization programmer at the NCSA. Coming from a musical background, it seemed natural to him to add sound to pictures. Our goal is to help scientists to understand their data better through using whatever means possible, if that is through visuals or if it's through sound or a combination of both. Um, we're not interested particularly in creating a soundtrack that is aesthetically pleasing or creating a musical piece, but instead what we're doing is looking at the data and saying what mappings to sound will make that data the clearest. Alan Craig teamed up with Carlos Galetti a composer and postdoctoral researcher at the university's Computer-Based Educational Research Laboratory, or CIRL. She had designed a software package specifically for music composition. The software, called Kima, works by grouping strings of digital audio samples as sound objects, or icons. The icons can be rearranged and combined to create new sounds. When used with a digital signal processor called the Capybara, the data streams can be calculated and played in real time. The Kima Capybara system is ideally suited for data sonification. It was only a short step to say, well, let's take an external stream of numbers. Um, in this case, it's time-varying data, just a stream of data points. And we'll treat that like a sound, because it's, it's just like a sound. It's a stream of numbers. The Kima system allowed Scaletti and Craig to create tools for mapping scientific data to various sound parameters. Among the many parameters to choose from were volume, frequency, harmonic content, or placement in stereo. Once the parameters had been decided on, the tools allowed interactive experimentation with the sound mappings. The challenge came in deciding the best way to represent the data sonically. Just like in the visual domain, you have to make choices of what, what color will best um, convey this information or um, what mapping of this data will visually make this data the clearest. Likewise, in sound, 
there's all sorts of questions that need, need to be answered from the um, representational point of view. To demonstrate the sonification tools, Scaletti and Craig created soundtracks derived from the same data used for existing NCSA animations. They synchronized the sound with the corresponding video at NCSA's post-production suite with the help of editor Jay Rosenstein. In this way, they tested and prototyped several tools that could be used by researchers. We've developed a tool called Mapper, a tool called Marker, a tool called Histogram, a tool called Comparator, and a tool called Shifter. The tools Mapper and Marker were used on this animated map depicting the changing landscape over 300 years in the Yellowstone Forest. Visually, the age of the forest is depicted by shades of green. The older the forest, the darker the green. Forest fires appear as flashes of red. Using the tool Mapper, the average age of the forest is mapped to a siren-like tone that gets higher as the forest gets older and marker is used to mark the outbreaks of fire with a burst of noise. The bigger the fire, the louder the noise. I think if you change some of the sounds, at least for me, it would come across Landscape ecologist better, David yeah, Kovacic originally well. created the Yellowstone Landscape Dynamics video to demonstrate the role of fire in maintaining the biological diversity of the forest. Now, by adding sound to graphics, the team aims to enhance the movie's power to communicate. It certainly does help you cue into what's happening as far as the dynamics go. A uh, very, very high-pitched tone relating to a non-diverse environment uh, is very effective in getting the idea across that, that this environment may be very susceptible to fire. Uh, sounds as fires occur also help you pick out those fires occurring. We think of the NCSA videos as something like live footage of a model world. And by adding soundtracks to these videos, we can increase the sense of reality of this model. A lot of the things that we're learning about mappings now are things that a scientist shouldn't have to go through all the error part of the trial and error. Um, if we can embed our knowledge into software, to help them make choices right up front that will be good choices for both visualizing and sonifying their data. I think that would be a, a, a very valuable contribution to the scientific community. Listening to Severe Tipei, professor of music at the University of Illinois, play his composition, Maiden Voyages, you are taken on a journey into a new realm of sound. The music is quite different from the romantic melodies of the 17th and 18th century. Tipe feels that the musical ideas of that period reflect a Newtonian clockwork universe and are thus outdated. Nowadays, uh, the scientists told us, tell us that uh, uh, there are other things in the world around us, like indeterminate things. Uh, there is a good deal of chance appearing at various levels, especially at the uh, atomic level. I think that music uh, and arts uh, uh, should reflect that. And what I'm doing, which is mainly computer-assisted composition, writing music with the help of the computer, uh, in this area, I'm uh, still the composer who decides uh, the great framework, the, the grand design of the piece and what's going to happen basically in the piece. But the details are left partly to chance, which is provided by the computer. To create his music, Tipe works with an unusual collaborator, a Cray YMP supercomputer. First, he enters sound parameters into MP1, a software program he developed to include randomness, and then he triggers the program with an arbitrary seed number. When the run is completed, the numerical equivalent of the score is translated back into notes by different software. The composer, myself in this case, uh, plugs in all kinds of data that describes, uh, in general, uh, the piece. But then the computer performs calculations. Uh, the goal of these calculations is to decide uh, what to put in the score, what every pitch and duration and dynamic mark is going to be in the score. 
Tipe can vary the score simply by entering a different seed number. As a result, no performance is exactly the same. Tipe calls this idea manifold compositions. The example you're hearing is entitled Many Worlds for Percussion. I want to show that the same idea can be realized in various ways, uh, rather similar in some parts and rather different uh, when I want it to be that different. This is kind of an interesting moment here because... Supported by NCSA, Tipe developed a seminar series on applications of supercomputing to music. The goal is to encourage collaborations that enable composers to explore and exploit the memory and speed of a supercomputer. Composer Robin Barger, one of the participants in the seminar, is also a filmmaker and a research assistant at NCSA. Combining his musical and visual talents, he is currently developing software to compute sounds and animated graphics in the same package. You might call it sonimation or making a sound instrument that responds to visual material, or making an image that responds to sound material. What I'd like is a workspace where someone is no longer a composer only of music, but a composer of pictures and of sounds. The animated movie, The Listener, is the first example of sonimation. The animation and much of the soundtrack were created with the same data and for both composer and audience carry equal weight. You know, Are you comfortable? It doesn't get any better than this. I map some of the expression channels from the face into sound so that the sound would reflect the facial expressions. The sound was not synchronized with the facial expressions, it was reflecting the facial expressions. Barger recently applied his software to a public service announcement promoting the virtues of recycling. The short movie was created at NCSA's Renaissance Experimental Laboratory. The piece contains realistic and surrealistic images and we wanted to couple with that sounds that were both realistic and surrealistic. So software was developed that would respond to certain animation events, particularly a scene where houses and garbage cans pop out of the earth and trees are sucked into the ground. Each sound is similar, but not exactly the same. It's not repeated. There's a composed interaction with the animation. In a multidisciplinary crossover, the tools of high-performance computing forged for science are now opening new vistas of expression for the artist. And the artist's unfettered imagination is helping to refine techniques that will ultimately benefit the scientist. I think that um, science and art have a lot in common in spite of the fact that not too many people recognize that nowadays. Uh, but I think uh, it's normal for science and art to share uh, a certain general vision, if you want, the same worldview. And uh, this used to be much more common, again, in much older times, like in Renaissance, for instance. What I would like is to be able to sit down in a machine make an image, make a sound, change an image and the image changes the sound or vice versa, and that I composed the system that makes those changes occur. So that on a different day I can make a different system. You can live in any universe you want and you're composing the universe and then the universe is responding to your instructions. In that sense, a scientist who's trying to represent their data using this tool, that scientist for that period of time would become a composer. This is a type of video book. You, the viewer, are encouraged to treat it as any other book. Skip ahead to certain sections, review particularly interesting sections, etc. Using this medium to communicate scientific information is an embodiment of the phrase, a picture is worth a thousand words. It is my belief that a picture with a simultaneous technical explanation is worth even more. David Rusick associate professor of nuclear engineering at the University of Illinois and visiting professor at the NCSA, is in the final stages of producing a video book to demonstrate his recent research in plasma materials interaction. Entitled, Hydrogen Collision Dynamics on a Rough Nickel Surface, the video book is proof of Ruzik's vital interest not only to explore the fundamental workings of nature, but also his dedication to communicate. 
I like to demonstrate when I teach and, and show models of things and, and explain how things work and, and, ha and, if possible, get the students involved with the hands-on models to, to understand what's going on. So this is a natural development, I think, in that here I'm doing scientific research, but again, I'd like to give my readers, the people that are learning about this research, the best chance to understand it by giving them some type of uh, three-dimensional simulation to view and to grasp and understand. Using a Cray supercomputer, Ruzik employed a code based on the so-called embedded atom method to model how a hydrogen atom interacts with a lattice of over a thousand nickel atoms. To approximate the roughness of an actual surface, fractal geometry was incorporated into the model. As the hydrogen atom moves near the surface, its potential energy changes, as denoted by corresponding shifts in color. The potential energies, positions, and velocities of all the atoms were computed once every half femtosecond. That's a thousandth of a millionth of a millionth second. Created by NCSA's visualization group, the video book's animations enables viewers to travel with the hydrogen atom as it hovers and enters the lattice. The simulations depicted in this video are intended to give insights into ion surface interactions. Aided by NCSA's media services, Ruzik adds the on-camera presence and narration needed to finish the video book. He hopes this new form of publication will be used as a resource for both educators and researchers. One of the striking results from this work is the importance and effects of atomic scale surface roughness. Simulations which do not take roughness into account will miss many aspects of reflection and sputtering that could occur. Inside here. Ruzik, along with his physics and engineering graduate students, is developing laboratory experiments to probe the real world interaction of atoms with surfaces. By comparing the observed data with continually updated numerical models, Ruzik hopes to further unravel the underlying science. One application of plasma modeling is to improve the plasma processing techniques used in the manufacture of semiconductor chips. Up till now, these processes have been developed primarily by trial and error. Another application is in nuclear fusion research. Understanding and thereby controlling plasma interaction with the walls of a fusion device is crucial to the realization of fusion as a new energy source. These various interactions, reflection, sputtering, electron emission, each of those, if you understand it and you understand the mechanisms that are involved, you can model why it occurs. If you know each of those things, then you're going to be able to apply it to both plasma processing and fusion because the same physical interactions with ion striking a surface at these lower energies happens in both cases. Beyond laying the groundwork for new technologies at the University of Illinois, Ruzik is vitally concerned with training tomorrow's scientists and engineers. He is dedicated to raising scientific literacy among non-scientists as well, such as these liberal arts students. They are benefiting from an introduction to energy, a course created and taught by Ruzik. Great, we're burning coal, it's hot in here. Well, what we want to do is make steam. So how do we make steam out of this? Energy science and, and the actual things that are done to make energy into usable products like electricity or, or making your car go, those are important fundamental things I feel people need to know. Now let's have the earth keep turning. Hey, Ryan, can you tell me when you can see the sun? And that's dawn. That's the sunrise. A demonstration at his son's elementary school in Tuscola, Illinois, delights the early graders, especially his son Ryan. Here, Ruzik strives to show children what really happens when the sun rises and sets, and why we see colors in a rainbow. I'm really excited about science. I, mean, I, I love this stuff. And I don't feel that any subject is too difficult to explain to any age with enough creative use of visual aids, I think you should be able to, to explain at least some of the basic principles, you know, kindergartners all the way through uh, graduate students and beyond.
If you would like to know more about the activities featured in this program, please contact NCSA at the following address.